My number five best game of the 2010s is Magnus Carlsen versus Sergei Karyakin from 2013 in Tata Steel. Now, at this point, Magnus was not yet world champion. He would win the title later in the year, but he was already the number one rated player in the world. In this game, we see Magnus in peak form. At this point in his career, peak form meant grinding and grinding and grinding in an endgame until you induce a critical mistake from your opponent. Here, it takes the maximum creativity to induce that mistake and then to convert against great defense from Karyakin once the mistake happens. This game literally features 43 moves of maneuvering before we get to some of the initial conflict in the game. As a result, we're going to move quickly through the maneuvering phases with relatively little comment as we want to focus mostly on the end game in this fantastic game. We do see an early surrendering of the bishop pair from Karyakin here, but he gets a solid position in return and it's going to be hard for Magnus to provoke any weaknesses or generate any real opportunities. In fact, he does doesn't manage to do that for a while. It is interesting that this pawn on e2 could be considered backward, but with the bishop on f3, it's really, really solid. So the one sort of weakness that Mag Magnus might have in this position isn't really very vulnerable at all. So we see a lot more maneuvering. We see some focus here on the c5 square, a funny queen battery. We'll see another queen battery later that I also like. And uh, we start to see slowly the players expanding with their pawns a little bit, but we don't see pawn conflict and a change of the pawn structure for quite some time. Here, I love this move queen to h1, a second kind of queen battery. Here, the king's getting in the way of this queen and bishop battery. But again, this isn't too effective, and Magnus is not managing to accomplish too much yet at this point in the game. One nice idea that comes about from the queen h1 maneuver is that later Magnus arranges to go and trade off the queens here. He decides that he's not really going to be able to make the progress he wants if the queens are on the board, so he goes to trade the queens and apply his trademark in-game skill. We do get that queen trade and more maneuvering play as the players zip along. Finally, b3 does result in a change in the pawn structure, although the position is still balanced at this point. And here we finally get a bit of a mistake after a4 with the move knight to c3. Now Magnus is able to generate some real opportunities. He plays bishop f4, tickling this rook. It goes over to e6, and now pawn to e3. The most likely outcome here should be that there's going to be a trade on d4, and then the d4 pawn can be a little bit weak in the position, and the position is opening in a way that is favorable to the bishop pair and might lead to some legitimate targets in the black position. Not a winning position at all, but Magnus is starting to get a bit of a pull here. I want to point out that in this position, obviously the a4 pawn is a target. If you try rook takes a4 in this position, you have fallen victim to one of the classic blunders because rook b takes c3 removes the defender of a4 if you try and throw in the check then the rook can move to safety, so you've dropped a knight in the position. Now, after pawn to e3, we get knight takes a4 instead. The knight can safely capture on a4 here, and bishop to d5, tickling the rook right here, and the rook falls back to e7. Now, Magnus goes for the most tempting move, probably the move that all of us would play, but it may be a mistake. Here, bishop c6, going after this knight on a4, actually seems to be the strongest move. After knight c3, you can go ahead and take on d4 here. It's really, really complex. You're not looking to actually win the exchange because of lines I'll show in a moment. But now knight e2 is the best move, um, tickling this, going after d4 in particular. And here, after bishop h6, check moving that bishop to safety, king g8, and then taking on c5. White is actually much, much better, so this might have been the strongest line available to Magnus in this position. If a little bit earlier, if we back up here, you had chosen to go ahead and pin the uh, rook on e7 with bishop d6 instead of throwing that check in, knight takes d4 is actually great here because you're hitting the bishop and hitting the rook. So that's an important theme here. Also, if we back up a little bit further still here, if instead of taking on d4 here, you go for bishop d6, trying to win the exchange with this pin right here, 
Then rook a1 check is strong. You are winning the exchange, but there's enough counterplay after this really important move um, capturing on e3 when, yes, this is vulnerable, but this is a big threat here. And when you capture back, there's enough play on the second rank with the active rook and the idea of knight d1, thinking about rook f2 check here, that black is not actually worse in this position. Really, really complex stuff here, but the point is that after rook e7, this bishop c6 maneuver seems to be the strongest in the position with good winning chances if very, very carefully played. Instead, Magnus does go for the most natural move, bishop d6, pinning that exchange, but it's not clear that this should be enough to win the game. In fact, after the precise move, knight to c3 here, tickling this bishop on d5, then even though you win the exchange, we get to a similar line to what we looked at a moment ago, where we take on e3 here. Again, this is a really, really important threat. And because of that, you need to take back, but then we dominate the second rank, and we get enough counterplay here for black. And again, black is not worse, crazy as it might seem. So now after bishop d6, what actually happens is pawn to b5 from Karyakin. And now bishop takes e7 check, winning that exchange. Bishop takes e7, rook takes b5. It looks like the game is just over, but it's not so simple at all because of knight b6 that Karyakin had prepared. And I think it's actually very possible that Karyakin thought after a quick look at the resulting position that everything was basically an easy draw and maybe this is why he went for this. Um, it seems likely that the players really disagreed on the evaluation as they went for these lines and missed what objectively were improvements pointed out by Stockfish and later analysts. Now after knight b6, if you go ahead and give up the exchange with rook takes c5 here, Yes, you do win a pawn in this position, but after all of these exchanges, black is able to dominate the second rank here. The active rook is really great. Black's king is in a good position. The pawns are not far enough away to really distract the black king, and this really should be a draw thanks to the active black rook in this position. So jumping at back after knight b6, it's simply time to give back the exchange right here. Magnus gives back that exchange with the move pawn to e4, and we get knight takes c4, and then rook check, a nice little intermediate move, and then bishop takes c4 here. Now, this is a really interesting position I want to talk about a little bit before we continue, because there's going to be another maneuvering phase at this point. You have opposite colored bishops on the board, but you also have rooks, so it's not a dead draw in this position. However, it does seem like it's going to be very, very hard for white to win in this position. Okay, you do have a target right here. You can kind of try and attack it. It's nice that it's on a light square, the color of your bishop. So your bishop is benefiting from being on light squares here um, because uh, you're able to attack these pawns right here, as we're going to see later in the game. But still, how much progress can you actually make if you go to play rook b7, then king f8, and the bishop sits on e7, and there's no real way to get to that pawn on f7. It's actually pretty sturdy. You can also say that this bishop is a little bit bad and hemmed in, but it's also holding the c5 and uh, d4 pawns together, so it makes it hard to get those pawns. Another thing that I would mention in white's favor here is that white is kind of like a pawn up. It feels like you have a 4-3 majority on the king side here, and there's some mobility to those pawns, some possibilities of pawn breaks, as we'll see, but it's still a very, very slim advantage for Magnus in this position, despite the advantages that we are mentioning, a better bishop, better rook, uh, a bit of an extra pawn thanks to this kingside majority, whereas black's extra pawn doesn't really mean anything in this position. In any case, we enter a long maneuvering phase where not really much is accomplished over the next 15 or so moves. Neither player is really able to do too much, although white does expand a little bit with the pawns moving up to e5, and black couldn't really stop that pawn expansion from Magnus. He's also moving the king, but the king can't really go too far into the position, so it's just shuffling around here a little bit. And finally, we get to the critical moment here on move 66. 
This is the moment, and Magnus does break right now. We get pawn to g4. Now, eventually, Magnus was going to have to try this move to win because there was no other breakthrough available. I will mention that the computer doesn't like this move because it finds the very narrow path to a draw that we're going to see in a moment. But again, that doesn't really matter. You have to try this breakthrough eventually and see if your opponent can hold things together. I think Magnus times it really, really well to come at a moment when Sergei is under some time pressure and it's going to be hard to find the time to calculate everything precisely. Now, after g4, of course, you just have to go ahead and take that pawn. And now the follow-up is pawn to h5, another great break right here. So the way to draw in this position spectacularly is to accept the second pawn here and take on h5. This looks really, really dangerous because pawn to f5 intends pawn to f6 check when you win the bishop. The key to getting a draw here is not minding losing the bishop, a very scary prospect when you're down on time here. It's hard to calculate, and it looks like these pawns are actually pretty dangerous too. The pawn pushes forward to h4, and after f6 check, you do not fall back with king g8 trying to defend the bishop because of pawn e6. And capturing here and also pawn e7 are just crushing threats. This is game over. Instead, after pawn f6 check, you must surrender that bishop on f8. You run forward with king to g6. The bishop does fall. And then another great move, king to f5 in this position. At this point, black has enough counterplay for a draw. And actually, white could easily lose this if white's not careful. For example, if you try rook takes f7 here, then g3 check is really strong. And if you try king f3, the other moves are also bad because of the advances of the pawns, the invasion of the rook. You here get rook to b2, and black just wins in this position thanks to the excellent threat of rook to f2 and checkmate. So this is a really, really important point in these lines. Now, also, if you try after king f5, bishop takes f7 in this position here. Then again, we get g3 check. Now, this isn't quite as bad because after rook b2, you can play bishop g6 check, but definitely black is better, so this is not something white should go for. Instead, after king f5, I'll mention one other move. You could try e6, but again, g3 check. All of these attempts to break through or take on f7 meet eventually with g3 check and likely rook to b2 and rook to f2 and checkmate. So after king f5 here, the key in this position is rook to h8 or rook to g8, but you've got to get your rook behind the very dangerous black pawns at this point. Do not delay. Now at this point, the thing is that black has a draw by perpetual check. You just shuffle the rook here. The king is not able to advance to the third rank. Trying to go after the rook is too dangerous because the pawns become monsters in this position. So the correct outcome is a very, very special draw by perpetual after the very precise capture on h5 here on move 68. Unfortunately for Sergei, that's not what he did, and after that h5 break, he played rook to h1 instead of taking that pawn. Now, he's accepting here that after a trade, he is going to have a target, and he presumably thought that he could hold the position or just felt that the other positions were losing, but in this position, this target on g6 is too much. Rook e6 is the right move for Magnus here, and the idea is bishop to d5 and bishop to e4, and you do win this g6 pawn, and then you're going to have two connected pass pawns in the middle of the board here. Now, king h6 happens, bishop d5 going for bishop e4. Now we get a nice sequence from Sergei because this pawn is undefended in the moment. He goes rook h2 check, and when the king comes up, rook h3 check does win the d3 pawn in return for the g6 pawn after pawn to f5. Now, g6 is falling. Sergei picks rook to e3 here, but after rook takes g6, we get an interesting position where there are connected pass pawns for both players in this position, and the material is equal. Now, there are going to be a bunch of really complicated and interesting lines that come up, 
But the basic gist is that white's pawns are stronger and white's bishop and king in particular are more active and more dangerous. The position is winning for white and these pawns for black aren't really able to make progress up the board. However, there are some easy ways to misplay this very, very sharp position. So at this point here, the king falls back. We get bishop to g8, sticking the king into the corner. There's a lot of mating ideas and ideas of getting the rook here and then just winning this bishop on f8. That bishop is totally, totally um, without good opportunities here. Now king f4 uh, slides over and defends that pawn on e5 in this position. And at this point, we do get an important decision. You could try bishop h6 here. This is interesting because after rook takes, you get king takes g8 right here, but then rook d6 is a winning rook endgame. Basically, the white pawns, rook, and king are all better and more active, and they're going to advance too quickly up the board here, and it is going to be a winning and very interesting rook endgame here. And also, after um, king f4 here, if you go rook e1, then you have the very nice move bishop to d5, and you again have this idea of rook to g8 check. All of that means that after king f4, Sergei tried to move rook to c3 in this position. Both players advance their pawns here. We get pawn to f6 and then pawn to d3. And we have a critical decision for white here. Now, there's actually only one winning move. And if you really want to challenge yourself and spend a lot of time on this position, I would encourage you to pause the video and try to figure out which is the only winning move and why is it the only winning move here. Now, a very, very tempting move here is bishop to d5. This is threatening rook to g8 check and, of course, winning this bishop here on f8. Now, d2 does look really, really dangerous because now the pawn is only one square away from promotion here. But after rook g8 check, king h7, and rook takes f8, it looks like white is winning really, really beautifully. You have here the idea of bishop to e4 check, king up, and then rook to h8 checkmate. If black queens, you just execute on that threat. The queen is of no help right here. Wow, what a great way to finish the game, right? Why wouldn't you go for this? It's clean, it's decisive, it's wonderful. The problem is that after rook f8 here, or rook takes f8, you have the amazing defense here, rook to c4 check from black. Beautiful, beautiful holding defense here that, man, if this had happened in the game, that would have been really crazy. What a defense by Sergei. Now here, bishop takes uh, c4, uh, doesn't work because black queens, and now bishop d3 check with the same mating idea isn't possible. d3 is under black's control. Also, after um, rook to c4 check here, you could try running up with the king and saying, all right, well, I don't have the same mating idea, but I have a new mating idea. Now if you make a queen here, I'm going to go check, I'll pull back, and then another amazing checkmate. I win again. Aren't I wonderful? The problem with this one is that after king to g5 here, backing up, uh, king g5 right here, you have one defense, rook to g4 check. And now when the king takes, then the black queen is able to um, promote here. The black pawn is able to promote to a queen here. Again with check. Now this isn't losing for white here, but after bishop f3 here saving that attacked bishop, it's also not winning and this position is just 0, 0, 0 according to the computer. Of course, who knows what would happen, but this isn't the win that we're looking for. Backing up, after the d3 push, we've ruled out this bishop d5 move that looks so tempting. We must now pull back with our king, king to e3. Our king is able to deal with the advancing black pawns, and that's going to give us the time we need to advance up the board. Now, in this position, black pushes with c4. It really doesn't seem like there's any good alternative. There are still wrong paths available to Magnus. For example, pawn to e6 check, or pawn to e6 looks good here, but bishop c5 check, and after the king falls back, Actually, bishop e3 is a checkmating net. There were some different lines that we could have looked at there, but I'm just going to leave it there and say that e6 is bad because of this sort of counterplay. Also, you could here go for bishop d5 pulling back, but then d2 check and king takes and rook d3 wins the bishop right here. 
Actually, it's not losing. You'll still be able to draw, but this isn't the win we're looking for. So after c4, the right move is bishop e6, pulling the bishop back just far enough, not too far. And again, you're threatening to just win this bishop here. So black tries king to h7, moving the king off of that dangerous h8 square and attacking the rook. Magnus falls back with bishop f5, which threatens tons of discoveries in this position. And now rook to c2, and Magnus decides to make it relatively simple here. There are other winning moves here. For example, Magnus can choose to push the pawn, but Magnus is a great in-game player, and he quickly judges that by giving discovered check, and going and winning this pawn over here, he is going to be able to win the opposite colored bishop in game. This isn't a position where black is able to make a blockade. In opposite colored bishop in games, you always have to worry about these blockades, but here there just isn't one available to black. King g5, the king comes up. Bishop to a3 here, king takes c4. It seems like you might just invade with the king and not bother to capture the pawn. That does also win, but capturing the pawn is cleaner because it's going to mean that this diagonal is open for the white bishop later in the game, which is really, really useful. So bishop b2 stepping up and defending that e5 pawn. Black advances here. We're able to push the f7 pawn, so no time to capture on e5 here. Bishop a3 falling back and stopping promotion. e6, if only black could get the king back into position and arrange a blockade on the dark squares. It would be a draw, but the black king is farther away than the white king, so that's not happening. King g5, king c6, the only winning move. And then the king steps up to d7 here, and after king back to g7, and then pawn to e7, Sergei Karyakin resigned in this position. What a wonderful chess game from Magnus Carlsen. Classic, classic Magnus. If you like this game and want to see more of my favorite games from the 2010 decade, then click on the playlist sitting right over here on top of the chessboard. And as always, if you like the content, then leave a comment or subscribe to the channel. It would be tremendously appreciated. Have a wonderful day.